What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Uncensored Critic Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again for another episode with a guest who I have to say I'm in awe of this lady's work. And it's a genuine pleasure to have her on the show today. And that is the astounding Kate Godfrey. Um, just give you a little just introduction of Kate's magnificent work over the years. Uh, Kate trained at the Central School of Speech and Drama and became a voice tutor at Mount View. The following year, she was personally invited by Patsy Rodenberg to join the voice department at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, as well as the National Theatre. She's worked on several productions, including the original War Horse, History Boys and A Habit of Art, uh, One Man, Two Governors, Three Winters, The Red Lion and several shows across London. And she is currently involved in the in the latest cast of The Ocean at the End of the Lane, which you'll catch in town at the moment before it shoots up to Salford a bit later on. Uh, she's also got countless work at the RSC, having worked on productions such as Venice Preserved, The Provoked Wife, King John, Museum in Baghdad, and it's like over the page. Uh, in film work, she has done, uh, she's worked on the uh, film with Fanny, Ad Fanny Arder in Z Franco Zanfrelli's Callous Forever. And Fanny is a two-time Caesar Award winner, and she was also the accent coach to Daniel Radcliffe on The December Boys, directed by Rob hardy and if that's not enough some a small handful of the incredible actors she's coached include keely hawes roseman pike jody comer and mr benedict cumberbatch and so kate how are you <laughs> <laughs> fine thank you <laughs> i was just like i know for well just like even writing that out yesterday i'm just thinking wow <laughs> <laughs> I've been very lucky. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I know you're in the mid middle of rehearsals at the moment, but uh, yeah, and I know we spoke briefly just now about how it's going. And I'm going to repeat the question I asked you all of two minutes ago, which is how, how's it going with Ocean at the end of the lane at the moment? Well, they're working incredibly hard. Uh, they're such a wonderful company. Um, we did a it wasn't even called um, a run through or a stagger through. It was a dot to dot, just putting stuff together. And they they did so well. Mm. So um, that was great. And we had um, a little session in a theatre yesterday just to get them using their voices and um, getting used to filling a bigger space. So, so that was very, very nice to do and, and I hope useful for them. I'm sure it was. I'm sure. It was. I, that, that, as I said to you, it's on my bucket list, that show. I need to get to Ocean at the end of the lane while it's in town. I know it's going to be here for a little while, which is good, but I will get there and see what work you've done. And I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Yes, um, actually, Oliver, it has been in town and now it's going off on tour. So it'll be all over the country, but it's it's done its run um, last year. It was um, in the West hmm. End. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yes, thank you for correcting me. Very good. Uh, <laughs> cool. So this is start a question I have for all my guests. Uh, so to begin at the beginning, as Dylan Thomas says, uh, so where did, in your case, where did the, because your your work stretches across text analysis, dialects and voice. So where did it all start for you? Where did it all come from? Well, I um, started off as an actor for about 10 years and um, was lucky enough to, one of my first jobs was at the National Theatre they have a studio and way back then they had classes that you could go to if you had been in, at the National as an actor and that was a, a voice class and a singing class and the voice class was run by Jeanette Nelson and the singing was Helen Chadwick and wow. um, Jeanette Nelson has been a, an angel in my life. She really was the one that um, encouraged me when I happened to ask her one day what is this job voice coaching she explained and where you trained and I said do you think I could do it and she said yes absolutely off you go and it's <laughs> just just championed me all the way so um thank you Jeanette um and then from there I but yeah I started teaching in drama schools and um then was asked to join Patsy and started working with professional actors and that was mm. about well I think my training was about 25 years ago so it's it's all been theatre really that's great that's great and of course I, I forgot to mention in the intro that you worked on uh well that's more text analysis but you worked with Jodie Comer recently on uh Prima Fassi and right. you know and yeah. the just um, I saw it I didn't manage to get a ticket because it, it sold out pretty much instantly and yeah. 
and um so that's but I'm, i saw it via broadcast and everything and it's on national theater at home now if anyone to stream um but so in terms of like the voice let's bring on to the voice and uh, i know it's central um there was a great article written about yourself in the stage a few years ago by a guy called tim i've forgotten his surname uh tim tim bano yeah and uh he, he talked about how you looked at the anatomy of the voice uh when you were when you were at central and what was it like sort of getting to grips with that well i found that i actually really like anatomy and that astounded me because i didn't think i was particularly sort of medically minded or or scientifically um minded either but um i found it really useful when you're you're dealing with a, a problem it was very useful in a diagnostic, um, the diagnosis, not the diagnosis of um, yeah. what to do with with your client. Um, so yeah, oh, but it's fantastic. only it's only sort of from the pelvis up to the to top of your nose. Really, it's not it's not the entire body. <laughs> there was a, a really quote that kind of caught my eye in that article, which was uh, Tim said. Let me see if I can get it up. Tim said that you looked at the, the anatomy of the voice from, quote, the nose down to the pubic bone. And yes, that, that that's right. yeah. <laughs> I was like, OK, right. <laughs> that's a, yes. it's a whole yeah. body experience. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. I mean, it, it, yeah. yes, it is. Um, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, what about the voice and everything? So um, what did you um, take from your training from from Central with, with learning about the anatomy and how to use the voice and what did it um how how did it impact you sort of going forwards from actor into into sort of voice technician in a way well uh, gosh i i originally thought i wanted to be a dialect coach but mm. i and we certainly had wonderful dialect coaching from jill mcculloch um but actually there was so much more that I didn't realize about sort of looking at texts and just the pure understanding of the voice and how to make it stronger and bigger and better. Because I think it was something that I struggled with as an actor, being heard in a space. Mm. And to to really get to grips with that was was fascinating. So it it just ha happened to be that I ended up teaching voice to drama students day in day out for about nearly 20 years um but I actually really really loved it mm. especially the one-to-one -one tutorials I bet I bet I, I recently finished at GSN and um does, does the name Chris Palmer ring a bell to you at all well I listened to her uh, her um, podcast with you and yes oh very impressive yes yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. yeah yeah thank you thank you for that um yeah she's just an amazing amazing teacher as well as person and uh mm. I remember on the first day she she's very clear about the do's and don'ts of the voice you know how to look after it and uh like what not to sort of put in your body to affect the voice and is it true what they say about um things like coffee and chocolate and everything how you if you're doing something quite regularly like if you were Jodie doing prima facie using your yeah. voice quite regularly um which is did you say to her okay this is what you can eat and this is what you ca can drink and this is what you can't touch <laughs> you need to preserve your voice no I, I didn't actually because I kind of think I think those things will affect some people's voices and maybe not others and you know mm. some actors they don't do a warm-up Mm. They have a coffee and a cigarette and they go on stage. <laughs> but maybe um, they are the ones who have been in the profession a long, long time. They know their voices very well. Their voices have had a really good workout, like a, a, a run for a car on the motorway. They've really, they've, they've really know and used their voices. Um, mm. So I think with, with drama students, yeah, you have to, you have to, to get that stamina up. Mm. Um, but to really answer your question, I I mean, nothing's actually going down through those vocal cords, but I suppose some, some foods will affect the mucus, the back mm. of your throat. And I think that affects others more than, you know, and maybe sometimes it's more 
effective, effective or not, and yeah. perhaps we need to drink more. Um, so I, I think it's probably more about um, hydrating your voice. That's mm. the most important thing. Yeah, that's, I can sort. I get this image now of you in a theatre and someone's not using their voice correctly, and you've gone, <laughs> you've had something you shouldn't have had, right? <laughs> <laughs> You can hear it in the voice. Yes. <laughs> good. Well, or maybe, yeah, you needed to warm up a little bit more today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, um, just thought of this now. In your in your opinion, what's um when an actor walks out, I know because some actors like that they like to walk out into the space before the audience comes in and use their voice to sort of get accustomed to like the acoustics of the place, like either walking out onto the Olivier stage or in the Harold Pinter Theatre, which yeah. is more intimate, Olivier is kind of bigger. Um, what would you say was a very good way of, of warming up? In your personal opinion, what's the best exercises some actors can do to make their voices as warmed up and ready as possible? Well, I suppose um, all these exercises were, were taught to me by Patsy Rodenberg. And one mm. of her main ones is breathing the space. And so it's practically the first thing I would do after a good stretch is that you actually imagine your breath touching the back wall of the theatre and particularly the back of the stalls which often have a sort of overhang from the circle above mm. and that's the hardest place to get the sound to mm. so I think yeah just really connecting yourself with that back wall mentally and then breathing a long s or an f or a, a, a hum or something to that focus spot yeah I think that that brings me on quite quickly today to your work uh, at the RSC. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've again, in that article, which uh, Tim wrote about, it's, it's a really in-depth one. You can catch it on the stage now, stage website. It's brilliant. And um, another, another quote, which really stood out for me on that one was, uh, Kate knows Shakespeare backwards. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, uh, where did the love of Shakespeare begin for you? And how did you end up at the RSC? Well, um I was taken to see shows at the RSC a lot as a child. And so I was very lucky to see Judy Dench and Ian McKellen do that Macbeth. Wow. And it was, I think I must've been about 15 and I was just blown away by it. It was, wow. it was really wonderful. And yeah. um, so, and I yeah and I, I saw a lot of shows at Stratford and in London um just take I was lucky enough to be taken by my parents yeah. um, so um and my dad was in the company so a lot of the time I was going because he was in the show mm. um and I think it came from there and just hearing Shakespeare around the house as he practice his lines and sometimes hearing his lines which would be you know holding the script for him and giving him back the cues so <laughs> I think it was an osmosis thing really <laughs> um yeah because I remember also at GSA we saw the old um what I don't know it's old. that's a weird way of saying it but uh like we saw tapes of like the John Barton tapes from yeah. from the 70s with yeah. a young Ian McKellen a young David Suchet and stuff like that and yeah. you know you see this image of like the RSC being everyone walking around, like, like walking, like with the beats in the Iron Bit Pentameter or anything like that. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. kind of lovely atmosphere. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I read with interest that your, your dad, um, uh, Patrick was in, was at the RSC when Peter Brook did his famous uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in, mm. in, in a white canvas. Is that, is that true? Yes, I think he just joined the company then um, yeah. and maybe hadn't even gone up to Stratford at that point. I think a lot of the shows he did with them were in London. Mm. And um, yeah, he took us to see that. And and then we were able, my brother and I, I remember us standing in the wings of that show watching wow. it. I don't know how how that was allowed. You, you wouldn't get that now. These two little kids, you know, just at the side of the stage as, as people came in and out of that, that show. And I said to him the other day, did that really happen or did I just dream that, Dan? He said, no, it did. It was a different time then. <laughs> but, you know, um, um, oh, there was what was known as the, the Rutherford leap. I think Mary Rutherford was playing Hermia. Yeah. Um, she had to 
leap at a closed door and Demetrius or Lysander came through the door and caught her. And, you know, so dangerous <laughs> when you think about it. Um, and there we were, just, you know, I remember a stage manager saying, oh, just, just stand this way because, you see, you can see through the gap in the set and you can see <laughs> the audience and they might be able to see you. So we were there. It was really extraordinary. Wow. So what, what what was it like? Because I've I've only seen pictures of of the set. You know this blank canvas of of a set, and you know seeing all these actors doing their stuff. And um, uh, you know Dame, Dame Gemma Jones was in the cast, wasn't she? As, as um, was she, I'm pretty I sure. Don't, I don't remember. Maybe I was I was yeah. so little. I'm not sure. Oh no, no, no. no. Um, but yeah, she um. Did you have any other? But what was it like looking at possibly you know in theatre terms one of the most famous sets to have ever to have ever existed? Well, I suppose, I suppose then it was just another show. Yeah. And um, but now I'm so very grateful to my parents that they they took me to see that because I can say I saw that show. Yeah. Um, and I I think it was so groundbreaking at the time so it wasn't mm. really just another show but it but yeah. it kind of was but it was really push pushing boundaries yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I have another question about it I know you said that you you know you were quite young at the time and just kind of remembering little bits and pieces but do you do you ever remember meeting Peter Brook because you, you must have worked with him quite a bit no no I never worked with him and oh, I okay. didn't meet him sadly but my my drama school I went to Signet theatre mm. training in mm. um, Exeter and he was the patron okay so we learned sort of but uh, we've used a lot of his exercises in our training mm. but and sadly I never met him no. oh, yeah I, I went to see a talk he gave a talk at the national a few years ago just about his career I mean is he had about 45 minutes and it was like how do you sum up your whole career in 45 minutes especially yeah. if you're Peter Brook of all yeah. people but yeah, but I remember reading The Empty Space when I first went to university. I read drama at Sussex Uni mm. and just getting real, re really captivated by just how the simplicity of theatre and like, again, that Midsummer Night's Dream production, how something can, you can create a world of Shakespeare with literally a blank canvas and yeah. everything is just magnificent and everything. Yeah. I just love, I love the idea of, you standing backstage and like they're going okay if you just stand two inches further to the left yeah you're going to have a very physical memory of this production and you're <laughs> going to come crashing through and they're just like yeah I was yeah. physically hurt by that production well thankfully you weren't I'm just saying no no but I don't know it was allowed <laughs> <laughs> oh magnificent um so yeah tell me about um because I mean what a birth of in into Shakespeare you know you get that that production and then and then you get to the RSC um what was what was it uh, your love of Shakespeare you know and how you approach Shakespeare now when you work with actors on like you know we mentioned King John and you know you know Midsummer and mm. what what's your process well actually before we get into the process you know your love of Shakespeare can you can you define it exactly because I can't define mine <laughs> no I I suppose oh gosh um i th i think it's 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 really when he manages to articulate exactly how you feel mm. or you you know that feeling or you've been through that emotion and the fact that he chooses the perfect word for it mm. um and i love the way well, it was fascinating being in Stratford, actually, because we were doing King Lear with um, and Sir Anthony Cher. And yeah. um, he talks about those flowers that he makes a sort of garland of in Act Five. And those very flowers are growing by the wayside in Stratford, even now. Mm. And in Cymbeline, they talk about the cowslip with its five sort of red spots that the, the color of blood mm. and I saw some growing in in a garden in Stratford and I took a photo and I was able to show the actor this is this is what you're talking about mm. when you say that line um it was Iacimo in, in Cymbeline yeah and it was it just 
kind of thought, oh, he really is kind of walking along these streets with me. He really is you know, yeah. from here, which, which makes me kind of think it must have been him yeah. <laughs> who wrote those plays. Yeah. But I don't know. That's a huge debate. And um, yeah, yeah. Fair I enough. don't know. If I know, yeah, the, do you believe it? It's do you subscribe to that belief that it was more than one person that that created these plays? I, I think some of them are collaborations, mm. maybe the later ones, but I I don't I I, I don't know I, I I don't know. But there there are times when I think it must have been a man that lived in this area that wrote those plays. Mm. Yeah, because you know, as as you said, like the flowers and and King Lear, you know, in the hair and stuff. Mm. And, you know, it's fascinating. I think one quote that I think, well, there's many quotes that still give me kind of goosebumps, but one is, oh, no, and it's forgot, and it slipped my mind, how convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's the one in Othello, um, one of Iago's pieces, hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. And I, the first time I just read that out loud, I was just... I don't know. I goosebumps. I can't. I can't explain it. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, how does he do it? Honestly, yes. it's, it's yes. incredible. So yeah. moving on to your process, then. So when you, so you're in the rehearsal room day one. Uh, mm. Actors have learned their lines, done their homework. Can you hear them speak mm. it for the first time? And then you want to offer some notes. Uh, what yeah. what's what's your process through rehearsal to get actors to? And again, I think it's mentioned in the stage article as well as that. You want actors to simply essentially know what they're talking about with yeah. this text. You don't want it to sound flowery or like it's like an extract from the Bible. And I like, do correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so when you work with actors, how do you sort of get to the, get them to get to the core of what it is that they're actually saying? It might, might be an obvious question, but if there is, well, what's your process of doing that? No, I that's, I guess it's, I mean, I would... I would say to the stage manager, I'd love to have a one-to-one -one with so-and-so mm. and we would mm. sit down and, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is kind of putting it into your own words, using your own, you know, just just to, just to try that on, just to see if that helps to connect you more to the word. Mm. But it's also um, understanding the situation, um, Maybe it's allowing the beat, the iambic pentameter to just pull out the, the words that are actually often the most important word is on the beat. Mm -hmm. And they might have just missed that or they might have missed the fact that, you know, like that quote you did just then, it rhymes. People mm -hmm. really shy away from rhyme and actually, you know, the audience, your, your brains kind of light up. They love it. It, mm. it might be that actors feel it's a bit childish, but but actually, it nice. just keeps us listening. And I suppose, and this was a was a John Barton thing as well. You know, anything that keeps us listening and makes it easier for us to keep listening for three hours. Mm. Um, so if you can, you know, enjoy the the alliteration. Um, maybe it's that particular choice of word um it, it's it's that kind of stuff that we would we would look at because you have to be mm. very very careful as voice coach not to direct that's a that's a, it's a fine line sometimes but you really mustn't go over it mm. so it has to be about what's on the page mm. and and i suppose also it would all as well as the the understanding of the language and making it make sense it's yes and what point is Shakespeare making mm. or what point is your character making mm. so perhaps we would use um a sort of a, quite a lot of rhetoric in that are you appealing to to the other character's sense of um logic or are you appealing to their their ability to feel mm. or are you appealing to their ability to to do what's right or you know um mm. that's pathos and logos and mm. ethos i've slightly twisted that one because ethos is really about um vote for me i've been there i've i've seen it i've done it i i know what you're going through um that's what the, the senators would call ethos and i'm sort of mm. saying well 
perhaps it, it could also be an appeal to is it is it really right is this okay with you that I'm here and I'm starving like a Volumnia in Coriolanus that appeals mm. to her son you know look yeah. at us we're we're in rags we've had nothing to eat is this okay with you really mm. and she persuades him through making him you know go go to his sense of morality I suppose yeah and it's that speech um uh, is is one of those it's I, I suppose like if you're working with an actress who does that it's a speech which changes the even though you're kind of three quarters of the way through the play at that point and that is a moment which changes everything you know Coriolanus realizes that you know allying with Al Alphidius and then all of a sudden he's reminded of his own um of his own origins and his own dignity and everything that he's kind of thrown away because of in anger because he's been rebelled against in in the town and mm -hmm. in in the city sorry and um that just it's amazing that you know with that one speech i think i mean would it be fair to say that when you say to like an actress who does that speech or something similar mm -hmm. it's like this is like to get to the truth of this this is the real game changer this mm -hmm. is the moment in the play which everything changes even though we're nearly at the end mm -hmm. after this slight spoiler coriolanus is going to die mm. and he yeah. dies because of another betrayal on top of everything it's like a double jeopardy thing isn't it he betrays yeah. his family betrays alphidius and then then he dies and um that you know you know you must sort of say to actresses you know the weights that you've got to carry in this moment really think <laughs> about yeah. what's happening right now yes although oliver i suppose they might argue yeah, but I can't play that yeah. as a character. All yeah. I can play is my situation and trying to get my my son back on board and tell him to cook, you know, call yeah. off the dogs. Yeah. Um, as it were. But um, but I know what you mean. Yes. Mm. Um, and it is incredibly important. So you um then it's it's hard, you know, you don't want them to then really push that, uh, yeah. because that in a way makes it difficult for us to process the information perhaps take it on when it's a little bit kind of shoved at us yeah of course so it, it's yeah. um, finding that that balance yeah yeah that's great you know, i'm very aware that was quite a heavy way of talking about it <laughs> just looking yeah. at it now yeah. the actress is probably going what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> too much information okay sorry okay mm -hmm. just just play it beat by beat and you'll be fine yeah. it's all gonna be yeah. okay yeah it'll be good um Again, with that article, um, you you mentioned about uh, you gave advice for auditions, etc., particularly for people who go along and they pick one of the most well-known speeches, like for example, "To be or not to be," or yeah. "Now's the rent of our discontent," or "Is Brutus sick," etc. And you know, and you say, "Don't shy away from that." You know, you know, put yourself in that moment, and you might hear, well, the panel might hear something new. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I was on the panel a, a bit at Guildhall, um, mm. and okay, I didn't do it every single day, and maybe every single day you might think, oh, I wish they would choose something else. Mm. Um, but if it really speaks to you, yes, you might find something new in it, and if you if you really try and you know don't just do it like everybody's done it don't look it up on no. youtube perhaps no, 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 no. or not till you've really found your own way into it um but yes perhaps also i'm going to contradict myself now um i now think oh i wish i'd done that speech or or um when i was auditioning for drama school um because i it's it's great nobody knows about it quite so much so mm. so yeah it's it's good to keep maybe looking at those less known maybe the histories they might have especially for men there's some fantastic um speeches in king john for instance mm. and um yeah and i think now everybody can do everything can't they so mm you know the lesser known plays you might find a little gem that not many people do yeah 
I think I, I had a similar experience where I did uh, Oh for a Muse of Fire, you know, the prologue of Henry V and yeah. deconstructing it with the Shakespeare great at GSA Jack Vessel. You know, I felt like I, I'd done it before, I'd done it a few times, but then when she helped me sort of deconstruct it, you know, and as you mentioned earlier, just find out what exactly is, are they talking about? And mm-hmm. in the chorus's case, it's like, essentially, all right, hello everyone thanks for coming uh we've got no money we've got no set and i need you <laughs> to use your imagination to the best of your ability so uh, okay so when we say there are horses over there just yeah pretend you see them all right okay yeah, <laughs> that's right I, I need i need your help here <laughs> we yeah. we've got we've got anything else but yeah. um so that sort of gave well for me i think a new lease of energy which is like welcome to the show we need i you need no what, what am I trying to say here? We need you as much as you need us for this to work. And yeah. um, it gives it like something as simple as that. It gives it a new lease of life. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going to ask this now. Is there a, if you were to sit on audition panels going forward and you heard a speech, it was kind of two questions in one really, but which one were you like, oh, I haven't heard that for a while. I really want to hear what they want to do with this. Or, and the other one is, oh, not this again, please. Just please try something else. Um. Well, I, I suppose we're always curious to know what they're going to do mm. with the speech, whether we know it or not. And we, you have to remember, if you're auditioning for a drama school, they want you to be good. Mm. They really, really want you to be good. Mm. So, um, I, yeah, I, I didn't kind of think, oh, gosh, here we are. You know, I've heard this so many times. But, huh. The ring speech from Twelfth Night. I love that speech. Off you go. Let's see what happens. And um, so I, I yeah, I, I, hopefully I didn't have a kind of, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was always, this one's going to be great. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be great, of course. Um, I said, and, and another thing I sort of picked up on was um, the, you pay particular close attention when you I thought yourself and I think everyone doing Shakespeare's you focus on uh, antithesis and the alliteration because I think that creates so much more for us and I think you know I'm guilty of this as well I go through lines and now I realize oh that's an antithesis or that you know pay attention to that alliteration yeah. I've gone yeah. I, I noticed it and then suddenly when you do notice it it's like that gives the line an entire new well a tiny breath of life and you understand why it's yeah. there Yes, exactly. And antithesis was, oh golly, yeah. I you've reminded me now. I've practically every note was, you know, just notice this. It's 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 the argument. It's how it's being set out. It's, um, and and then you can look for that in modern writing as well. A really good writer has all those rhetorical devices. Mm. Um, you know, Patrick Marber doing the Red Lion. That yeah. was a wonderful show to work on. It wasn't mm. Shakespeare, but it could have been because everything was there. Uh, slightly on a slightly more fanboy kind of angle for me now, if I may. Uh, you, I, I did um, the History Boys um, a few, nearly 10 years ago now. And I know you were involved in the original production with Richard Griffiths and uh, yeah. Russell Tovey yeah. and people. Um, yeah. You know, what, what was it like working with, you know, because you don't have Shakespeare in that sense. But when you approach a modern text... Mm. Uh, are your are your methods pretty much the same? You know, make, pay attention to the text here, use your voice this way, or is there a difference because of the difference in text and difference of language? Well, I suppose it's the same, really, because what we're doing with the Shakespeare and with modern writing is is just making sure that an audience hearing it for the first time mm. get it because they only get one chance, and so you're off. You're if you're watching in rehearsal you're you're kind of encouraging the actors to kind of show us the audience the writer's choice of words Mm. and um and so that involves you know them being clear and feeling confident and owning those that text owning those words um it also might be making sure they're not straining their voices there's that aspect of it as well Mm. um it was very early days for me when i did that show so i was i was kind of finding my feet okay 
as well. So um, yeah, I think I was I was I was there more just in the room, kind of thinking, "Wow, here I am <laughs> with all these great actors." Yeah. Um, it's so I, choice, yeah. really. <laughs> yes, and and then taking warm ups and stuff. Yeah. Um. One. Well, once they were up and running, yeah. Of course. I love the quote again that, that this article has got so much in it. It's great. Um, how you had to sort of have a word with Richard Griffiths at one point because uh, you, you were like, Richard, we've got to do some work now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it was anecdotes. Really? Yes, this, this was when he was in um, Habit of Art. Yes. Where yeah. he plays. Um, uh, oh, God, Auden. 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 Yeah, the poet. And. Um, I think he was, he was, it was kind of to get him to sound a little bit like, like Gordon. And so we were listening to some recordings, but, but he, he was such a wonderful man and a wonderful raconteur mm. that, you know, I, I was kind of looking at my watch thinking, we haven't done anything and 40 <laughs> minutes has gone by. And <laughs> Richard, we really got, really got to do some work now. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> what, what what would he do? Because uh, I I miss him greatly. I love I love his work as an actor. It was a shame to see yeah. Sandy no longer with us. But what, what what would he do in the rehearsal room that would take up all this time? Was it just joke after joke, or is it? Well, then he, I think he was. You know, he was absolutely getting on with it. But this would be in a one to one session that we had. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and I can't now remember these stories, but oh, just wonderful. It was lovely working with him. Oh, I missed him dearly. Mm. Oh, rest in peace, old Richard. Mm. Um, so do you have like, um, we've just got a few more questions for today. Um, do you have like, a, if any actors who are at drama school or uh, are going to apply who are listening or watching along now, um, Kate, is, is, there, is there like a, a checklist or something that you've summarized over your, over your career that, so if someone picks up a piece of Shakespeare for the very first time or looks at a contemporary monologue for the very first time, yeah. is there is there like a recommended checklist of things that they can do to help them get the best out of their speeches from your from your perspective? Oh, right. Well, um, I think the first thing would be it, it's really boring, but look at the punctuation mm. and start with the full stops particularly with Shakespeare, because it might be that there is one full stop in the entire speech. And and it's quite interesting not to just look at the one that you've got off the net, because it'll be different, perhaps, from what's printed in a book. Mm. Um, and so looking at, you know, how many thoughts are there? How, how then is the, you know, are there um semicolons which which i would kind of i'd say they were like junction boxes mm. they're putting two thoughts together and so you one half of the thought you're setting out something and then it's the little semicolon is like someone saying what do you mean tell me more and then you then um elaborate on what you've just said mm. um and colons if this is if you particularly if you're doing a cold read in an interview and you've had very little time to look at the speech mm. if you see a colon the bit after that is really important so do something with it no you know if you see that just go to town on whatever comes next because it's probably going to be the most important part or something with a big impact mm. so um yeah, I think punctuation is is key. Um, if it's Shakespeare, look at you know, is it prose or verse? Does it rhyme? Um, and antithesis, as as you pointed out, that mm. that really helps you navigate your way through through the argument um, and the imagery. Mm. Is it, does it stick to one theme? Um, Yeah, I was just, there was a quote the other day um, and had the word break and then, oh, um, 
Yes, it was uh, Lady Percy talks about there was a time, Father, when you broke your word. And mm. I think and I, was, I was sitting on the tube trying to remember. And is it when you were more adhered to it than now? And I suddenly thought, oh, adhered. It's like it's like adhesive. Something's mm. broken and <laughs> you just stick it back together. I mean, that's not not the the meaning of it, of it really. But but I just thought and that's maybe why, you know, it's adhered and broken. It's. Um, I never noticed that connection before. Mm. Do, you, do you have a memory of a speech or a moment in a Shakespeare play where you came across a speech that you were obviously very familiar with and you heard it for the first time? You you heard it again, but it was like hearing it for the first time. Um, well, I remember watching um, Mark Rylance's Hamlet. Wow. And there's the the point where um, he's 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 talking about the the ghost coming and telling him to kill Claudius that you know he's been murdered, mm. and I remember having the thought, yeah, but the ghost might be tricking him, and then a moment later that was in the speech and I've probably heard the speech before but it was just so surprising that I suddenly thought yeah I feel I'm really thinking alongside Hamlet here and um yeah I, I didn't know Hamlet very well then I was mm. quite young then still so but it was it was just so satisfying to think yeah exactly I'm with you Hamlet I know what you mean it might be <laughs> it might be a trick yeah i never thought of it like that way before that's yeah. what if the ghost is i think some people have said what if the ghost is just an illusion from hamlet's mind yeah is he is he there is he actually there or, or anything yes. like that? Yeah. yeah yeah did you um ever see jonathan price do hamlet at all no i didn't no, no he played there's footage emerged that he played it like he was being possessed Yes. By the ghost. So yeah, he did yeah. all the speeches. So there was no other actor. Yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting take on it as well. Yes. Is is this coming from Hamlet's consciousness? Is he being possessed? Yeah. Is this whole revenge trip something that's been in Hamlet ever since he found out that his his father died yeah. as a result? But of course yeah. we know Claudius was involved. But ah, yeah. oh, but where's that's Oh, questions, yeah. questions, questions. It's mad. Uh, it's very good. Um, you, met, you mentioned Mark Rylance then. I think you worked on another thing with Mark Rylance. Is it a five-hour epic of yes. The yes. Wandering Jew? The Wandering <laughs> Jew and Country Mania was another. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. Yes. What was that like? <laughs> five wow. hours. Golly, that was amazing. And it didn't, didn't seem to us, or to me anyway, like it was five hours. Um mm did seem just like a sort of regular show but the interval was about 40 minutes long so that mm. we went to the canteen and had something to eat and I think the audience had something to eat as well <laughs> um yeah it was it was a, oh it was an amazing time um working with Mike Alfreds and um doing sort of acting exercises with him we rehearsed for 18 weeks that show and other shows in the, in the theatre would come and go, and we were still <laughs> rehearsing. You know, they'd, they'd have their first day of rehearsal. We were still rehearsing. They'd have their <laughs> opening night. We were still rehearsing. They'd have their closing night. We were still rehearsing. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was five hours long. Yeah. Wow. Followed by another five-hour show. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean... It's obviously, as you said, to you, the creative team and the performers, like you're, you know, you don't recognize how long it is. But then, but I mean, how how did you, go? I mean, actually, I think that's a really good example of, so for him to use his voice, I, obviously, I don't know if he was talking for five hours, sad, I didn't see it. But it, when you're, five, I mean, please, please don't tell me there were matinees as well. Uh, no, I don't think we did it twice. I can't remember now. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking if it, a 10 hour day is a lot for the voice. <laughs> yes, it is. And yeah. of course he, I mean, he's got incredible stamina because as a mm. young actor at the RSC, he was playing uh, Romeo in the, he did a Romeo matinee and a Hamlet evening performance. So he actually was using his voice. Wow. Um, 
and didn't seem to have a problem with Wandering Jew and Country Mania. I think it was much more ensemble. So hmm. if anyone was really on stage all the time, it was Philip Voss who played the sort of main um, character in it. Hmm. And what, what, what advice did you give him for maintaining his voice for all that time? Oh, well, I, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't a voice coach then, and I was oh, okay, sorry, a very green actor, so I wouldn't have dreamt of um, oh, I see. doing that. But yeah, I think I think hydration and and voice rest as much as you can. Oh. I mean, I think that's that's what a lot of actors do anyway. They they live like monks, some mm. of them, just to mm. save their voices. Yeah. Where do, where do you stand on vocal rest where some actors don't talk for like days at a time? Is that, yeah. is that, is that a thing? Well, I think they, you've had to sometimes do that if you've had surgery and they tend not to yeah. operate quite so much now. Um, uh, there's this technique where you blow um, through a straw into a cup of water mm. and that activates the muscles around the vocal folds mm. it still rests the vocal folds i don't know a great deal about it but mm. um i think that's that's been useful for keeping things from atrophying mm. and um so at the end of the night particularly when you're talking to mark rylance after you know if you you know that voice coach if you were in that position like for wandering jew i've just yeah. seen the poster behind you actually just <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah. I was just like wondering oh yeah <laughs> that's, that's cool um so you know for him after five hours or someone after doing three hours of Shakespeare you know mm. what's like the vocal warm down uh what would you recommend that actors do to you know because they've just used it solidly for the last three four hours and yet they've you've got to sort of turn it down it's like a warm down after an exercise you know yes what what would you recommend actors do to warm down just uh, glide from the top of your range down just humming down the range not going back up but just each time from the top down again mm. and again and again mm. um just relaxes the vocal folds and, and gets them mm. back to a relaxed point i suppose back to a relaxed yeah. point <laughs> no, yeah. that's good and just <laughs> just very quickly um what's uh what, what's he like in person mark rylance so i've never met him hopefully i will one day what's he like in in person Oh, he's very impressive. He was, um, well, I th I suppose it's before he'd really um, been discovered. Mm. Uh, he was certainly on the way. Um, he's a wonderful actor, very, very funny, very generous, great uh, company member, company leader. Sorry, I thought I'd put that on silent. <laughs> um, um, he's a great company member, and he has a very sharp um, political mind as well. Mm. So um, he's very articulate, I suppose, mm. is what I'm picking yeah. up. Yeah, hopefully I will meet him one day, because his work is just extraordinary, because, you know, I yeah. heard all about Jerusalem and the original production at the Royal Court, and people feel like that was a moment in time, that they yeah. were glad that they were there you know yes. yeah yes. it's like the second coming of jesus or something i don't know some, something quite quite extraordinary like that um but yeah that's great so i, I know we're kind of pushed for time at the moment i know you've got to shoot off to do other things soon um but I just quickly want to touch on your work with dialects and of course your involvement with prima Fasi recently so um i know text text analysis is your main body of work but you know you look at dialects as well so uh how does one hack a particular dialect or an accent that they're having trouble with is it all about just listening and finding the placement in the mouth or is are there other ways into it um well yeah it is the shape in the mouth but for mm. some for some actors that just doesn't make sense to them i think as a as a dialect coach one has to really know what's going on mm. um and you can kind of say well it's this is an accent that's more in the back of the mouth or the front of the mouth. Uh, if you can get recordings for them to listen to, um, yeah, and they've, they've really just got to keep keep listening to them and not panic that you're not going to get it, you're not going to get it. it eventually, mm. I think it, it starts to sink in. Mm. Um, 
and I, I've, I've sort of got sort of lists of peculiar sentences where the same sound comes up again and again and again, mm. so that um, you see that particular sound surrounded by different consonants, which can make it sound different, but it is actually the same sound. Mm. Um, to to get the actors just to get confident with maybe the the, the sound that they feel really um, unsafe, to <laughs> <laughs> very dramatic, but um, or just the same vowel sound, different words again and again and again. I've I've started to do that a bit, mm. and um, yeah, I, I think. Once they start to know who the character is, that helps as well. Mm. Um, but but yes, it, it is really what the tongue's doing and making those those vowel shapes, mm. what the resonance is. Yeah, is it is is there one accent you've had to teach quite more frequently than and what more frequently than the others because other people find it trickier to to get a grasp of. I think it probably have done American the most, oh, okay. but mainly because that's what's come up. The yeah. Most. Mm. Um, but yeah. Um, and when I was at teaching at Guildhall, I was I was I was teaching RP. That's how you know. Now I think we wouldn't do it in quite that same way, but. Mm. I learned a lot about other accents because I was teaching my own accent to them. So I was learning without knowing it. I think I was learning about how, you know, Americans have to work really hard with their lips because they're not used to work doing that work and mm. rounding their lips quite so much. Yeah. So you, therefore, when you're doing an American accent, um, I love to, you know, say to them, you know, freeze your top lip, keep your top lip really, really still, and that sends mm. the sound strangely into the back of your, into the back of your mouth, and mm. gets it into the right position. Mm. Finding that it's, it's almost like the, as they say, the stiff upper lip does does help to get to get RP RP through, if that makes sense. Yes, but this is actually to help get the American accent, funnily enough. So oh, it's, really? Yeah, it's not wow. just a British thing, although it's associated with yeah the British having stiff upper lip. Because <laughs> mm. <laughs> all the sounds into the back. Because there's so many different dialects. Like you've got New York, you've got standard American, you've got Southern. Mm. Um, is it does the same rule apply to all of them, or are they all quite different in a way? Um, I think it might be a starting point, and then yes, and uh, you evolve then, into uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you evolve into other things. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I know, I know, we've got just a few more minutes left before you have to shoot off to other things, but I just have to ask you about uh, Prima Fassi and yeah. uh, with the incredible Jodie Comer. Um, I saw it broadcast. I thought it was, she did an impeccable job, mm -hmm. and uh, I just get this feeling now that when you work with actors, the RSC, you've got a company. And you have one to ones, and you work with people individually. What was it like sitting down with Jody with all this text and going, "Oh yeah, this is this is all you." <laughs> this is all you. Yeah, she was amazing. She came to that rehearsal room with that play in her head. I mean, she wow. really knew it, and she'd done a lot of homework. Mm. So my job and and accents are her thing. She didn't need any help from me. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she hadn't done a lot of theatre, so my job was to just get her vocally fit. She did have a mic um, during the performance, um, but the, the sound, uh, the sound mixer said, you know, that it's barely on. It really is her. And of course, they say this to actors who are mic'd in shows. Imagine you you're not wearing a mic just use your voice so um we had to just get her her stamina her her power and to make sure that she wasn't straining and we had 27 hours for the whole of the rehearsal period that's all they could afford for me to do that 27 so, hours yeah <laughs> not all in one go yeah yeah, yeah. yeah of um, course <laughs> <laughs> but um spread out uh, over four weeks 
And that included me watching, you know, the run throughs and well, certainly, yeah, the first or second pre preview. Mm. But she is remarkable and she took to that work, work like a duck to water, you know, she just mm. did it. And um, it was amazing and didn't lose her voice. No. And was clear and loud and confident. It was astounding what she did, actually. Yeah. I mean, that... not been on stage. Yeah, because yeah. that, that was her West End debut, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Wow. So, it's like throughout the rehearsal room, like it was the same process of just sitting down with her. Because I know you worked with just her text um, analysis with, with that, not so much um, dialects, but mm -hmm. was it just a case of, I know, as you say, Jodie knew it already, but did you help her to sort of, break it down section by section or was it more of a case of just make making sure that everything was clear and she was looking after her voice well I had to really concentrate on voice in my sessions but yeah. I would often after we'd finished I'd stay and sit in on rehearsals and um you know it was a lovely inclusive rehearsal room with everybody contributing the director the writer and I would just put in my hatefully worth as well of oh and have you noticed this word or what about that or um and sometimes but very very rarely I'd say I'm not quite sure what point is being made here can you make that a little clearer can you can you really spell out the argument a little bit more here or um but most of it really to answer your question it was just voice 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 yeah and you know I'm sure she owes a lot to yourself because um yeah that performance was amazing and that came from because she was communicating with her voice obviously but oh. uh but you know she really came across that there and I think you know that's a testament to the hard work that you did as well just to to make her sound clear and enunciated and everything and uh yeah and I'm sure well I think the audience have you to thank for that as well because <laughs> <laughs> be very clear about that um i just got one more question for you today i know time is very against us now um but this has been so much fun just listening to you about your experiences and i mean i got very intimidated when you said i was in the wings for that 1970 peter brook midsummer night stream <laughs> like you were there <laughs> age, age nine or something <laughs> it doesn't matter it doesn't matter you were there yeah. oh that's fantastic okay thank you yeah. so much for today but just to finish on today yeah. uh this is a question i ask all my guests which is what's been an experience in the industry in your life evolved with all this work that you've done that you'll never ever forget oh wow um well certainly prima facie but also i did um a production of oedipus at the battersea arts theater oh yes with tom morris and that was in the complete dark i mean you even had to cover up your watch so a pin prick of light didn't show through mm. so it, we were all blind like Oedipus mm. and um, it was a fascinating production because it used sound and sound effects were made live with people sort of brushing olive branches or chapping stones together and um, and it had an extraordinary effect on the audience because um, the the players were all around us they had to hold on to ropes and and bars to know where they were in the space and when Oedipus blinds himself I, I felt a sort of flick of maybe it was sweat or something as as Oedipus went past me it was just some water or something and I was convinced I would be splattered with blood I was so in that that production mm. and um it was just so different that that's that's really stayed with me as being fascinating to work on i loved it well i think any any dramaturgs listening in now take that idea <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's a very good idea no i hope they I hope something like that comes back that sounds fascinating yeah that's... we had to get permission to um, black out even the fire exit um lights Ooh, and nice. we had to tell the audience you know we'll put the lights on uh if anything happens and we'll go this way <laughs> but, uh, yeah 
fire exit where, where do we go I have no idea. yeah i know <laughs> I have no idea yeah it gives me like beckett vibes he did a play called not i we blocked out all the all the lights and stuff really? just a mouth on stage very yes. interesting yes. very very good good stuff well kate thank you so much for today this has been an incredible conversation to have with you i've really enjoyed listening to you oh, and just you. the no no and just everything you've done the work you've done just I mean, before today, I was looking at all the stuff you've done and I was just thinking, I really am in a company of someone who's just not only done some incredible work, but someone who's going to be remembered for a very, very long time. And the the work you've put in and the stuff you've been involved with and the way you've articulated yourself today, it's been it's been so much fun. It's been a genuine pleasure listening to you. And from the bottom of my heart, just thank you for giving me your time today and for coming on my show. And I really, really appreciate it. And I've really enjoyed this, this chat on anything i'm not just saying that because you're here i'm saying that because i mean it and uh thank you um cool i've finished the recording if you just hang on after i finish the recording i'll say goodbye to you one-to-one yeah. and um yeah guys thank you for watching thank you for listening this has been the uncensored critic podcast and i will be back soon that's thank you for watching thank you for listening and once again kate godfrey thank you thank you oliver it's been really lovely <laughs>